Hello, innovators. I am Dustin Miller, Poly Innovator. Today, we're talking with Leon Shao, the YouTuber of Tight Tips channel, a life coach, mental health consultant, and overall working towards your certified personal coach in life. Thank you for joining me on the Polymath Polycast. It's wonderful to be here, Dustin. I did forget to mention the TEDx speaker as well, so that's awesome. This is a show by Poly Innovators. Please say hello to the innovators in the audience. Hey, everybody. <laughs> I love the energy. You brought it in today. It's awesome. And so we met on the 52 Living Ideas Meetup a, during a Comprehensivist Wednesday. How has your experience been on that? It's, it's been incredible. I've been, I really love that group. So 52 Living Ideas is a really incredible meetup. And that's where I got to meet Dustin and hear about his incredible ideas on polymathy and how you could get those polymath uses going. Yeah. Well, and I thought too, we were talking about this different types of brains and how people think differently. And I think it's going to be a great topic for us today. Right. Right. Hello, and welcome to the Polymath Polycast. So the way I like to break the ice is to have you share something about yourself that no one knows about you. Yes. Yeah, so about five years ago, I was finishing my master's in educational psychology and had this incredible opportunity to witness polymath energy in action. And that's when I was part of a research group looking at what is it like to put artists and engineers together in a classroom? How would that be like? And as a researcher, what I saw was a lot of conflict that was going on between people of different disciplines. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, well, this is not going to get anywhere. But the result was that with the combined efforts, their work is more creative than any discipline alone. Yeah, especially the coming together of this, the artistic values as well as the engineering mindset and making sure that everything's perfect in those certain ways. Right. Being there, I think that has really inspired me because that was a very unique opportunity in a way. First off, I learned that conflict is a precursor to depth mm -hmm. when, I was, when I was there, that that conflict allowed the disciplines to rub against each other in a really un unpleasant kind of way that forced each one to open up in a way that it has not experienced before because the disciplines mm -hmm. have an automatic way of doing a certain kind of project and that conflict forced them to first of all work through that conflict and i think just because you're getting two, two people of two different disciplines together you're getting them into a relationship and for some reason they, they say like it's after a conflict in a relationship you find more depth in a relationship that there's more meaning to it and i think that's the same thing with disciplines when you have the conflict and you find the meaning behind how it's like to bring those two together. And it's interesting too, because we're both working on different communities for kind of doing something like that. And I created a community like for people like us to collaborate and the hub of other tribes to gather. You've created a community with intentional thinking and how people can work together. What are some pieces of advice do you think that we could do to bring those kind of people together? Yes. The advice I could give is basically from the story that has evolved from that. So from my experience with that group, I have learned so much about the value of bringing people together who are very different. So I start to experiment with my own life. I thought, what if I forced my perspective to be different from what I take for granted and deliberately join groups, which I have nothing to do with, just basically show up at the wrong places. Yeah. So I started that, what that inspired me to do was that I, I joined a chess group where everyone was over 70 years old. Hmm. And then I, and then I joined a craft picking group, which everyone was a 40 to like 80 year old female. Mm -hmm. And I remember the person, like when I signed up, the person who saw my name on a sign up sheet, she rolled her eyes. And once I joined that craft making group, I immediately proposed to lead a craft making workshop the, like the very next week. So basically force, force it. So another thing was that I, I, I joined this uh, entrepreneurial group and there was this guy there who was like very shady. He had this like very shady salesman smile. 
And I, I felt a certain kind of resistance to talking with him, but I said, no, I'm going to talk with him anyway. And I got something very fruitful. So he gave me some really good advice on my YouTube channel on how to make it grow. And so it's like, yes, I, I'm putting aside everything that I assume. I assume to be true. I assume to be um, ethical. Not saying there's not to be ethical, but to be able to go beyond my own narrow world is. Yeah. And, 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 then, and then bring in the ethics later. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's interesting too, because it's just about getting yourself out of the comfort zone as well. Like not, not just comfort zone as in just, Hey, I don't feel comfortable doing this, but also comfort zone as in, is this within my morals or virtues? Can I go beyond that and experiment? Exactly. Exactly. I actually did that with water aerobics where I started teaching that class because I, I was like, even though I'm a young person, I'm a male, everyone else is over 60. Usually when it comes to water aerobics, even the teachers too, half the time. And I was like, I'm going to get my way in there because I want to teach that class. I want to experience that class. And I just put, I asked my boss, like, hey, I want to teach it. Can you give me a chance? A couple yes. days later, it happened. And it's just a matter of going into the circle that you may not be okay in normally. Yeah, I think it's like jumping in, uh, not even waiting until I'm ready. I just find that when I decide to do something, even when I'm not ready for it, it takes me to a whole nother level that I'm mm -hmm. able to accomplish something that I have not accomplish before or have realized something I have not realized before. So I decide from there, I'm going to get people together in any way, shape or form, people from different walks of life, from very different experiences and fortunate to be living in as a diverse an area as New York City. And I started to organize meetup groups. One's about the, the Mars Briggs, getting, getting together people who are of different very personalities and understanding what makes them successful in their own way. And I learned that everyone takes their own way of thinking very um, for granted. And people assume the way they think is the way everyone else thinks. And actually people who join that uh, MBTI meetup have told me they kind of assume that people are thinking the way they're thinking. And it's so surprising to see people think in fundamentally different ways. And there's a lot of neuro research to back that up that there's fundamental different neural patterns in which the brain fires. So there's certain brains mm -hmm. that fire like a Christmas tree. And that's, that's basically your, t your type, say ENFP fire fires like a crisp, like, like a Christmas tree and other brains are more like they're, they're extremely efficient. So they use very little energy mm. in, in the brain. So I thought like, instead of bring in your assumptions instead of saying, okay, well, I don't like people who do X or Y kind of, kind of like with what you have with the pillars, you have the mind, body, heart, and, and spirit, There's mind, body, people, spirit, and emotions, mind, body, spirit, and emotions. And you can kind of relate this with those personality types that they favor one area or over the other. And often yeah. the ones that favor the body in the, in that group are not favored because they're not viewed as um, intellectual, but they're actually, you have to ask, but why are they able to achieve in ways that y you aren't? And that's the question that I always ask myself. Well, it's interesting how like a lot of times you think like the meathead bodybuilder who is not very smart, but think about how that guy got to that point or girl, like anybody can get to a bodybuilder state. And right. it's interesting how you have to count your macros, count your calories, make sure you're getting a certain amount at a certain time of day. It's when you eat more often than what you're eating or how much. And making sure that all the different details are accounted for and how much weight are you doing? How much are you progressing? And you, it gets down to a very scientific intellectual level in order to get a bigger body. That, 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 that is really interesting. I never thought about like when mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> eating. Yeah. It's just good to approach everything with a certain kind of curiosity. Assume that we, we are biased. So kind of like assuming that I'm, I'm wrong all the time. And um, so I started to, I organized another meetup group called Creative Instigators in the past. And the idea is to bring together people of very different disciplines and mm -hmm. have a really fun community. And a precursor to that was there, there's a group I joined called the Creative Research Group. And there I organized a group of people to make artwork out of nature. So we just got, so we just went out in, in, in nature and we got some twigs, we got some rocks, flowers. And we just put them together. And another one was um, there's somebody else leading that that group in which 
he decided to do like this really big surprise and he's not going to let us know what we're going to he's going to get us into and so he took us on a car we don't know what's going to happen and then he drove to the mall it's like okay th this is the mall this is not very like interesting it's very ordinary we went inside and he said okay we're gonna all have our toenails painted <laughs> so he got everyone's toenails painted and then everyone was like really hesitant but we decided to get that done and after afterwards he took us to a gun shooting range hmm. And he says, okay, now, like, wh what is that experience like putting those two together? So this is not something you'll typically do in a, in a day. Well, maybe some people d do, but like, I, I, I don't. Especially both in the same day. And it's interesting too, you could almost think of the masculine and feminine kind of energies as well from that. And right. something that came to my attention is that you're an INFP and I'm an ENFP. How do you think that would impact our interactions then? Well, um, whenever I communicate with people, I do like, I do think about their type, but I keep it in the back of my mind in a way. I always like to try to find a way to relate. And I know that like for both types, how they relate is the, the potential for um, seeing a lot of possibilities and being able to pursue those different kind of possibilities and be able to pursue a lot of alternative ideas. So that, that, mm -hmm. that's a way. And I always see what I could learn. So I, I try to take my um, biases away so for me I'm gonna prioritize certain things as um, as an introvert and then you're gonna prioritize different kind of things and so I'm gonna like almost uh, pretend I, I am you pretend like what if I just prioritize all this kind of things and that actually that an extrovert does and that actually has expanded my life quite a lot that I, I, I basically got myself in situations in which uh, are very extroverted and then yeah. I just kept challenging myself and actually that muscle like could really grow and even in in one day you could feel the difference you're like you're almost taking on the energy of another type well and I did that with introverts actually I was very extroverted growing up but I realized I needed to pursue self-development at a young age and I felt that introversion would help me stay at home and recluse and right. be more isolated so I can actually spend time doing that meditate read uh, work out so those are all pretty solitary experiences unless you're doing it with groups I guess but it's one of those things where I had to train that and now I've become more of an ambivert and something you mentioned there too is like taking up on the energies of that the first thing you did when you came on is get all expressive with your hands and all smiling. That, that was a very extroverted gesture in a way. Yes, and you're that, trying to. Yes. Yeah. And that, that is very much learned. I actually grew up with very severe social anxiety. And if you looked at my high school picture, I wasn't even smiling. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will say half the freaking photographers always tell you not to smile. So that's on them too, I feel like. They always put yes, a lot of pressure on you. But I, I was definitely uh, very quiet and not very eloquent. So I really worked on my speech. Um, I used to mumble a lot when I speak or I didn't share a lot. But I think with a lot of practice over time, especially since I have the YouTube channel I practiced in front of a video, then mm -hmm. that really has got me to speak. And what I learned is that I, I spoke with a neuroscientist and he said, Dr. Darinardi, he has this great work on the MBTI. And what he said was that, yes, there's type typical brains, but when they start to get certain kind of education that activates different areas and certain areas of the brain that they're not used to activating or they take up a sport when it's not an athletic type those areas start to light up and over time the types become type atypical it's interesting too because one of those things that you're doing is trying to push yourself out of your comfort zone and i think with videos it doesn't matter if you're extrovert or introvert it is kind of a scary experience uh, even just hearing our own voice there's a bone conduction when we speak and so we hear our voices as deeper because of the vibrations in the bone and so when you hear recording you don't hear those vibrations anymore yeah, you so you listen to yourself pitch. and you're like who the hell is that yeah. Exactly. I still cringe sometimes when I hear the recordings. I, I hate it and I, I've gotten used to it, but I don't like it too much just yet. But I like seeing the conversations <laughs> that we have. And so I can like, okay, I can get over my like little issues with that. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, w I agree with you. I, I used to really not like my voice when I first heard it. Well, and it's interesting too, because even, even now, even after doing over 130 audio casts and I don't even know how many videos, 80 videos at this point. I've done a lot online. 
but I don't do live very much. And so when we actually met, one of the times we'd seen each other at the 52 Living Ideas meetup, it was live. And I felt nervously for the first time in ages because I was like, okay, this is live. I can mess up and people can be like judging me for that. And so I remember being a little bit nervous, but just taking a deep breath and relaxing and going yeah, past that, it. That's true. Like even like really famous people are, who've, for instance, they're a musician and they play thousands of times. They're still nervous getting up on stage. Mm hmm it's interesting and i feel like that has to do sometimes with our personalities as well but one thing you were talking about your youtube channel and i was watching on there this idea of balance and having this rest and being able to not overwork yourself avoid burnout and so how can one find balance between discipline and rest yeah i think it's a paradigm shift so i think there's like this um, binary in people's mind things are you're either like working hard or you're being lazy but I think there could be a synthesis of the two. It's not simply about balance in the sense of compromising your, your hard work, but actually further enhancing your hard work through very smart practice. And so I think, especially since I work as a psychotherapist, what I find a problem a lot of people have is that they get stuck in their head. Mm -hmm. So they're always, they're actually working very hard, but they are stuck in their head and they're trying to figure things out they're trying to make things work and they're trying to solve the problem and when people are in that mindset uh, nothing gets solved and nothing gets fixed it's almost as if you're always returning back <laughs> you're pointing at yourself yeah. <laughs> there's there, there's a lot of times i experience that too so when people get into that state what what's happening is that their forebrain is taking over and it's, it so it could feel like well you know i work so hard but not I'm just going around in circles and I'm going back to square one. I just have to work harder, but you feel tired and you think, oh, maybe I just don't have enough energy. But actually, it, it is a kind of mindset thing. It's coming from that kind of forebrain, that part of the brain that's trying to orchestrate everything and is, is starting to take over. So uh, and it's also this idea of like the sense of independence, like I'm the person who's trying to as an individual trying to figure things out for my own life. So I decided that as, as uh, someone who's very interested in neurodiversity, so that has been a research topic that I've been part of uh, in my graduate studies, I start to find people have these natural strengths and weaknesses. So why not rely on other people? And also <laughs> why not uh, find put yourself in a space where, where you can make the most use of what your own strengths are? So. First, first of all, what I find is that I start with the clients. So I'm going to start talking with my clients first before I address that other part about uh, where the neurodiversity comes in. So they're, they're trapped in this thinking, thinking, figuring things out kind of state. So I try to coach them up, a certain, up to a certain level where they're possibility minded, where I'm saying without holding you to an answer, what would you say? Um, how, how would you respond? Or I ask them, like, pretend that you've uh, fallen asleep and you've woken up and the solution has arisen to you. How would you be feeling? What would you be doing? And the thing is, what that does is it, it cuts out that figuring out kind of mindset and puts people into the realm of possibilities, the realm of what they could be doing. And then they say, oh, yeah, they get into that energized state of how would they be feeling if they were motivated and they were able to do the things they want to do. And actually starting with that feeling, starting with that possibility mindedness, they're actually able to accomplish more. You can actually see their energy being lighter. It's easier for them to come up with solutions. And so something that keeps coming to mind as you were speaking, so I was trying to tone it down so I can act and listen there, but flow, the state of flow, being in the optimal state of focus, because yes. you mentioned the, the front of the brain being more activated and orchestrating different actions and thoughts, but a lot of the best work and creativity and expression comes from that flow state where it's hypofrontality, the prefrontal cortex shuts down essentially and allowing the brain to actually activate much more natively. And it's interesting how there's something I didn't know about, like you were kind of saying earlier about when to eat, you didn't know about that. Something that happened to me when I was learning about flow is that there's a recovery period. So after you get into that higher state, all the neurochemicals flushing in and 
making you feel great, there's a big kind of uh, period afterwards, like, hey, now you need to rest. Now you need to recover those neurochemicals. And it's a balance between that discipline and rest. Like, hey, you have that discipline to focus for that long period of time, but there's a consequence to it, a good one. Like you still need to rest, that's okay. But you have to account for that. And the more you do, the more you consciously take account what actions you're taking. And this goes into what you're saying with the neurodiversity as well. You can prepare for it more and then be able to do better in the long run afterwards. Yes. Yes. I think it is like um, being able to switch between the conscious and the unconscious mm. and being able to tune into when. And that's actually tapping into an intuitive part of ourselves, almost like a, a light focus. And I find uh, like, for instance, when I am playing guitar or doing artwork, when I am trying to force things and I feel like I'm working really hard, I feel like I'm putting in the, the hours, that's when I actually, the acceleration rate is the slowest. But when I, when I, when I put it away and I allow the accident to happen. So I'll, I'll give you another example of work and rest. So like. Uh, I played a really difficult uh, jazz piece and people, it, it's about seven minutes long and people are like, how do you learn this piece? This is like really difficult. And I, and they think about like, oh, I must be putting all this like hard work into it. And yes, it took many hours and, and weeks, mm -hmm. but actually I was able to do it because I changed the way I did it. The way I was doing it is I was trying to learn it each note at a time. And, and when I make a mistake, I won't progress unless I get that note correct. And I, but that was very demotivating and got nowhere. So I decide there's certain parts of the piece which I find easier to play. And I, when there's harder parts, which I didn't get right, I just allowed myself to be sloppy on those parts and just do it wrong. But because mm -hmm. it allowed me to play, play through that whole entire piece many times, and because I really enjoyed uh, playing the easier parts of the piece, it got me into a motivated state and the practice effects got me to get the easy parts done much easier faster than if I would just yeah. do, do the piece from the very beginning to end. And when I got that down, then I was motivated to get this little bits of the hard parts down. So it's like really listening to my lazy side. Yeah. Well, and it's also makes me think of uh, video games actually, because something I've done is to try to go against my personality, for example. And so do, have you ever played many video games in your life? Uh, I'm not much of a video, video game player, but I have played. Okay. Well, there's a game that's a good example, Fallout, Fallout 3, where there's a karma system in the game where you have lawful good, and it's originated in D&D &D and whatnot, where you have lawful good and chaotic good, neutral good, and then you have the neutral level, then the evil level, so chaotic evil and lawful evil. And it's a nine-piece ch uh, nine chart, and the, depending on the actions you take in the game, you'll fall somewhere on that chart. And I, I think a lot of people, including myself, always fall into that good, if at least the chaotic good, but that top layer, because the choices you make are often going to be good ones. But I often try to find myself challenging myself to do the opposite. So like, hey, if I'm going to do this action, let's try it this way. And it was almost like training that muscle to do a different decision to see what the outcome could be like, because it is a game, it's just like just a digital simulation. But it's interesting how even when I try to do that, I still end up being like lawful, lawful good, because <laughs> just the, it's the inherent notions. And so so I just thought that was interesting how even deliberately trying to change it, I still couldn't get past that. Yeah, that, that is interesting. And I think like changing things is a lot, much like, much like a, a process. So I realize when I'm working with clients, they have so much, they could, they could feel like changing psychological habits is difficult, but it's actually a lot like changing physical habits. So one time I was inspired in, in terms of how I would like to be able to treat my clients who are having difficulties making changes by one time I was taking a walk and I really want to take a new route, but I keep forgetting to take the new route. So, but I only remember when I'm halfway through my old route. I said, well, you know, I'm halfway through my old route. I'm not going to go all the way and try to, to another location to do my new route. So I'm going to finish this old route. And the next time I go back to my old route and I have that same habit again. But I decide, you know, maybe it's not really black and white. I don't have to change from my old route to the new route completely right away. What I do is, so I was basically halfway through my old route again. I decide, you know what, I'm going to take a few steps towards my new route. So I took a few steps towards my new route and that created change so that it reminded me next time to take that new route. The so, mini habit. Yes, exactly. The, it, it is the mini habit concept. 
And it's the same thing with uh, psychotherapy. Psychotherapy. People believe that in order to motivate themselves, they need to be very harsh and hard, and basically goes along with this idea of you need to work very hard and be very difficult on yourself. But actually, that's the worst way to motivate yourself because what happens is the brain shuts down. Your functional IQ actually lowers when you are scolding yourself like that because it's basically mm-hmm. putting yourself into fight and flight mode. Like for instance, when we start to call ourselves a loser. Uh, for doing something wrong, that's the same thing as like almost like what if you're threatened by not having enough money to to pay your rent? You're not going to、mm-hmm. be thinking clearly. You're not so. So the idea is actually、yeah. the kinder you you talk to yourself, you actually not only do better, but it's better for your brain. You actually improve faster. This is interesting because I had an experience that's almost kind of opposite, where I activated the fight or flight response, put it in a good way, like you can do this, you're gonna do this. And over the years, I've, I've been a personal trainer and swim instructor, water wrestling instructor, fitness related for most of my life, and I've also pursued my own development, of course. And one of my main things was push-ups, because push-ups is an easy way to scale it up and get used to new challenges. And some of my habits would be trying to go for a large number, going for a volume. And I got to two twenty, two hundred pushups, not in a row, but just two hundred twenty pushups in a sitting, where、wow. I was like, okay, I'm kind of hitting a barrier here. I want to get past it. So I told myself, okay, the goal is gonna be three hundred. Make it audacious, make it moonshot, and maybe you'll land there. And I remember one day in particular, I tried going for it, and I got stuck at two twenty and ran out of time. Like I ran out of time. I couldn't do it. I had to go teach and go do something. So the next week, I came back. And I did it again, and I got numb. My muscles were numb at 2:40, and I managed to get there. I had 15 minutes left before I had another responsibility to go attend to. 15 minutes, my muscles were numb. I had already fallen on my face three times, and it was one of those things where I told myself, "No, you're not going to leave until you do it. You have 15 minutes to do this. Sit there and do it." And not only did I get into the state of flow, but I also activated、yes. my adrenaline and was able to push through the last sixty as if I just start over. Basically,、yes. it was like well, that, that, I, I think that's like that's a really good use of tough love with the emphasis on the love portion of it. So I think with、uh, like for instance, calling oneself a loser that that's not coming from a loving place. So I think that's the, that's that is the major difference. I, I believe, yeah, tough toughness is、uh, is an important part. Well. It- Just real quick, the, there was that water experiment. I don't remember what it was called, but they took like three bottles of water. One was the control. One was they said loving things to it, like "Oh, you're awesome. I love you," and very positive things into the bottle, sealed it. They got another bottle and said horrible things, like "I hate you. You're disgusting. I don't like you," and closed it off. And after a week, they they did a microscope on it, and the positive one was crystallized on a microscopic scale and very、wow. pretty and happy. And then the negative one was like sludgy and nasty and like grunge. And it's just、yeah. interesting how. That the positive emotions just verbally affected those containers and water. Interesting. Yeah. Th- this this goes along the lines of、um, psychic research,、mm-hmm. right? I, I I've been interested in that kind of. That's kind why of I thought、stuff. I'd bring it up. <laughs> <laughs> that that is. Well, speaking of、uh, spiritual, like,、um, so I, I encounter that kind of spirituality when I'm doing my work. So I'll, I'll give you an example. So I have this I have this self portrait here with me、uh, playing、yeah. the. Playing the guitar, and and then、um, so I felt like the process. That I I think hard work is often linked with this, the conscious side. So, and I often you know I do get there, and I the problem is that I feel how much、um, pain, how painful it is to to be there, and I realize a lot of the choices I made for this painting are unconscious. And when I did it, it so the un- what about the red? Yeah, everything's kind of unconscious in a way. So, I feel like, for instance, I only knew what I was trying to do until after I did it. So,、yeah. one thing is only after I just painted, I realized I used the blue to、um, create that sense of calmness and stillness, and I made the hands red to create that sense of liveliness. And if I was doing it consciously, I wouldn't have been able to do it. But when I was just following along with that intuition, I I would have. So I think a great lesson I learned is that, kind of like what you said about like coming to this podcast, you don't have to prepare everything beforehand. You don't have. It's good to go off the cusp. It's, it's, it's just the idea of living life. It's almost like living. It's almost like creating an art piece in a way.、Mm-hmm. You don't know what's going to happen at the very end, and actually, it's even better. Than what you expect, so it's better not、right. to, not to expect. So over here, along the way, 
you see this purple around here. You, there used to be a lot of purple around my mm -hmm. arm to the extent it actually looked really ugly. And I was, during a time, I was not trusting my intuition that uh, I felt like um, I'm going to get this painting done really quickly. And I was rushing and I felt it. But after I made the mistake, I said, you know, that's OK, Leon. So next time I'm going to get rid of all the purple. And that's OK that I made the mistake. I know it's just you know, next time listen to your intuition. But I decided not to get rid of it. So I decided to integrate the purple into the painting and kind of paint over a bit with the blues. But yeah. I thought it actually looked good. So it's actually I'm integrating my mistake in a way. Like, What's the duality of red and blue? The, of like the, the image. The, You're blue, the background's red, and so it's a duality right. there too. Yeah, there's a duality. And I think uh, the purple is almost something that's in between the, those two colors. So I've, I've allowed myself to integrate the, basically integrate the mistake. So I think an issue that people face is that they don't want to like make a mistake, but I feel like everything is an opportunity. So this goes into this opportunity, possibility, mindedness, going from getting out of the level of thinking and figuring things out and trying to get things right to this idea of like everything has its place and you can make make it so that everything has its place. Well, and you, like you said about the polycast too, it's like, I want you to feel free form, answer the questions, how you feel. If you get too prepared, then you're going to have be a little stagnant. Although some people feel like, especially if they're more introverted, I feel like they'll try to prepare more. Yes, I, I, still, like, I still have that urge. I, still have yeah. I figured you would. <laughs> the thing, that's why I also take into account what personality types people have. I have a little spot on my, on my database of like, Hey, are they introverted or extroverted? So that way I can change my actions accordingly and try to make people feel more comfortable. But on top of that too, I'm a very perfectionist person, systematic thinker. And so I have all the questions there. I want to go through basically all the questions, if not more. And some of the best shows I've had have been where we've only done half the questions right now. We've only done like three. <laughs> and so like, it's one of those things where three and a half, I guess, technically that like, maybe we would have something in the long run, but it's a matter of what, what we're talking about now. We had some great topics already. And so it makes me think too, from painting to playing music, to creating content, you had this aura of creativity around you in your life, obviously there, what inspires you? What, what inspires me? I think I've been following my muse and this muse I have is kind of more than something that's concrete, it's more than any specific field that I'm pursuing. I feel like there is this knowledge that's beyond labels. And so it doesn't matter what I'm engaged in, whether I'm expert at it or I'm a novice, I'm increasing my ability to tap into that knowledge. So for instance, I wouldn't say I'm like a, a great chess player, but what chess has taught me was the power of long-term thinking, which I apply to everything else in my in my life and one thing i learned about long-term thinking is like in in, ch in chess it's actually not good to have a a long-term plan so you can't because things can change exactly so there you, that's the same thing with people making five to ten year plans and i, and I used to do something like that and what's long-term thinking is making the most adaptive moves mm -hmm. in the moment and that's something that i always carry with me so so I feel like I'm never at a loss because I never feel like, well, I mean, I do feel like, but I've changed my mind. The thing is one, I think one thing people struggle with is like, oh, I'm just getting started with this new area. I don't like to feel like I'm a novice in it, but I'm trying to look at knowledge in a grander scheme that I'm pursuing this uh, greater knowledge and it doesn't matter what field I'm in, I'm tapping into and actually the later I tap into something, um, sometimes, sometimes the better. So. But it is yeah. it is important to tap into it. So, for instance, I learned started learning Spanish two years ago, and Qué bueno. <laughs> yes. And the thing is, I felt like I learned a lot of things that I, I wouldn't have learned if I learned it like if I was five. There's there's so much in that process. I felt like I was able to connect up with chess. I was able to connect up with um, um, running meetup groups. There's some there's yeah. some underlying principle that is principles that are the same. 
Well, and it's that greater knowledge, that interconnected knowledge that I think is really put in for the show, the polymathy aspect. Right. I think that's why there's a lot of this polymath starting to spout up now the internet's here. It's not that we weren't there, but it's more about we, we just didn't know how to express ourselves in this very narrow-minded, specialist society. And yes. so now that we've found a pathway, like the meetups and stuff like that, or the communities that we're building, there's ways of going past the, what's the word, the confiningness of our society because the internet transcends that. Exactly. Yeah. So sp speaking like in spiritual terms, the way I, I look at it is entering to a space where um, walking the dog is no different from creating a piece of artwork. It's it's the same thing. And uh, speaking of which, um, that space overcomes all dualities and not in a way that's like in the Aristotle way where you're kind of find, finding some sort of happy medium between two poles, but actually in a way that one side actually enhances the other side and so what i found is uh, for instance this whole debate with society versus the individual the problem is that actually both ends are actually very similar meaning that they're all about the ego in the sense that there's the ego of the individual trying to promote itself and self-conscious and it wants to be above society but it's taking in the expectations of society in order to do that and then there's also society where if you say if someone is trying to blend into society not in a, a very um, individualistic kind of way it's the same thing it's the ego again piece it's being afraid of the judgments of others in some sort of way so they're actually very similar and actually i think both polarities they take people away from their self who, who they truly are and, when people could tap into who they truly are is actually the best way they could serve this society so actually they're mutually enhancing well and it's interesting you keep bringing up spirituality is that a lot of the time when i'm on these shows too either mine or someone else's i talk in a more rather scientific or knowledgeable in factual kind of way but i've always had a pretty strong spiritual side that i don't necessarily tap into when i'm creating content as much i try to balance it out but it's one of those things i don't necessarily appoint even in my, in my head the spirit pillar of the four pillars i think of spirituality is like the balance between the conscious mind and the subconscious mind the conscious mind being more ego the subconscious mind being more of the higher knowledge higher right. power so to speak and regardless of how you approach that, you could take it in a scientific way, you could take it in a philosophical way, because if you look at Eastern philosophy, for example, but it's one of those things where p me personally, I've evolved more to be in a, taking it in a scientific way, despite the fact I still need to do it the other way as well. Right. Well, I remember your idea, which I really, I really like, which is the idea of spirituality being getting to that point, which is between the conscious and the unconscious and having that interplay happen over time so that that's something i could really identify with so well and it makes me think of like dreams too or dreams are often ways of trying to figure out what the conscious mind is thinking but right. in a different way one yes. thing i thought was really funny just just randomly as i mentioned last night for the third time samuel l jackson came up in my dream vividly <laughs> and like i was having dinner with him and it was just like random i don't even remember exactly why or how or what was the cause of it but, but, just... but what, what was your emotional response to it I was just my extrovert itself. Like, it's the thing. I was just talking to him. Like, it was like, oh, making friends with him. It's just like, <laughs> it's so weird. Like, I haven't had a dream like that in a long time, but I thought that was kind of funny. Okay. So, so one thing that that experience was really uh, positive in a certain kind of way. So one, one mm -hmm. thing I like to do in my therapy sessions is actually treat dream material almost as if it happened in real life. So a lot of the questions I ask people about their real life situations, same thing when I ask about the dreams. Like, basically using uh, some some of the cognitive behavioral therapy of asking what first of all what is your emotional response to it and then when you have that emotional response what are your thought processes like what kind of thoughts went through your mind when you met samuel l jackson i'm trying to think i wish i mean it's almost 3 p.m today so it's pretty far away from the dream i'm trying to think of what actually happened at this point i only had the picture of us at the table yeah but and i just remember almost kind of not a vivid what's the word lucid almost lucidly that like i remember in the dream that i had a dream like it before and so it's kind of weird how that's been happening more and more yeah. yes lucid dreaming is becoming more prominent well, well regardless of what actually happened in the dream like if you were meeting samuel l jackson you got to have a conversation with him what would 
what you would you be thinking? I will try to appeal to his nerdiness because he's he's obviously very nerdy. He's like Star Wars nerd. He's also talked about uh, even anime and stuff like that too. So it's just interesting how there's probably some common ground I could find some way to work in and make a connection. Interesting. So it's like you're approaching it from that standpoint of curiosity. You're bringing your your um, the side of yourself that's very fascinated with people into into this into your conversation with Samuel L. Jackson. So I think like that dreams often tapping into an energy that um, that is very important for us at that time, right? Um, so it sounds like you already have this kind of energy. So often like the dreams they kind of present an energy where it's something that we don't we're not tapping into as much yet. So a lot of my dreams when I was um, throughout my life because I had really severe social anxiety was around loosening up. So I had a dream in which I was kind of in my dream I was drunk and then I got I got this rug and I rolled it up into a cylinder and I started kicking it around and I in, immediately spontaneously invited the closest people around me to to play and play this game I called rug soccer. I just called on that spot rug soccer. Let's play rug soccer together. So that that's that piece. I was basically when I first took the MBTI I, I tested one hundred percent introvert. So I would not do anything like that. But that whole idea is like anything that energy was like so extroverted. Like whoever was closest then um uh, I, I I could play rug soccer with. I could just like invent that game right on the spot. So that's the thing about like um I I think people are often concerned about whether they're wasting time, whether they, sh you know, where should they devote their energies in their life. But I feel like uh, you could, in a way, you could always make use of all time. I, I feel very cautious about using the term making use because that sounds like it's almost too pragmatic in a way. But it's like even when you are sleeping and you're dreaming, your your brain is figuring something out. So, right. so it doesn't matter. And I, I always make make use of it. So like when I wake up, then I write down what my dream is and and I don't have to do anything more. I don't have to like force it into my life. I just know that I'll be bringing more of that energy into my life. Right. It's interesting too, because just having that extroverted energy in their dream there, it made me think of like a experience at karaoke, for example, where my first song was by Queen and it was a more obscure song by them, Fat Bottom Girls. Not many people know it too well, but you know, I felt attached to it. And it's one of those things where it was the ego, like, hey, this is my song. This is the one I did for my first song. Your first song is always the most important. And there's another guy who was a regular at the karaoke bar, and he did the exact same thing. He had that song as his first song. And for most people, they might get antagonistic or even like egotistical, like, hey, this is my song, not yours. What are you talking about? But I try to flip it around, to flip the script, flip the script, so to speak, where I was like, hey, that makes us special. That means we should be friends. And I was able to make a connection out of that and build it up. And I think that's an extroverted pathway, right. so to speak. It's a connection that I made instead of choosing to be a technistic or being like making an enemy, I made a friend instead. Right. Yeah. That I think I think that is that is great. And I think there's a lot of truth to this idea of both working on your strengths and also working on your weaknesses. Because I think basically when you work on your strengths and not your weaknesses, everyone becomes very type typical. Whether Whatever their MBTI type is, they basically become the stereotype of it. And the ones who transcend it are the ones who do something that are different while also working on their strengths too. So I wrote this article a long time ago, but it was about um, certain personality types tend to show up in certain disciplines. And I, and I and I realized that it's only when, not only, but like when someone of a different personality type starts to show up in a discipline, that's when major transformations happen. When when there's when there's changes, because everyone was basically thinking the same way. So it's unfortunate that MBTI test has been used to basically put people into certain careers because you're just getting you're shuffling the same people in into the same areas. And we need that diversity. Yes. One thing I'll, I want to ask too, how have you balanced your creative with your scientific background in life? Because it's one of those things where we keep referring back to this balance and I'm curious. Yeah. Well, I like this thing. My, my, my favorite psychotherapist of all time is uh, Carl Jung. Mm -hmm. And he really believed that he was a scientist. And then, but when he was uh, doing this artwork, there's this voice that called to him from the inside his unconscious that said, what you're doing is art. When he, he's basically, 
he really saw himself as a scientist. And so he started to really listen to us like, well, maybe that there's a, there's a truth to that. There's a truth to that. And um, there's many of us, especially people who are interested in uh, being a polymath is that they're interested in that, in that intersection. And they're not simply satisfied with this kind of like a shallow notion of just compromising between science and art. It's how are they mutually enhancing? How are they one and the same or two sides of the same coin in a way? Well, then so this leads me to my next question pretty well, then is something I ask all my guests is what is a polymath to you? For me, I guess a polymath is someone who's really authentic. They're not believing in the, the labels that society has placed on the disciplines. And originally, a lot of the disciplines were one thing. So philosophy and, and science used to be one. And it's really the language has made made it out to be different kinds of things. So there are people who really appreciate an, a holistic, even a natural approach to life. So ironically, they're, I feel like they're actually following nature and people who are uh, saying, oh, th these, these polymaths are outliers. They're following something that is more artificial. Yeah, the construct of it, the social construct. Right. It's interesting. Then what do you think is the psychology of a polymath? Uh, I think the, the psychology of the polymath is one who they listen to their, their heart their, and they, they, they follow their bliss. And actually it's kind of as easy and also as hard as that. So what's the hard thing is actually when you follow your bliss, you actually, your, your psyche is driven to do things that are challenging, that are difficult. And I think uh, society wants life to be harder and easier in the opposite way. So how it wants life to be harder is that it wants to be you to be half of who you are, not fully who you are, not your full potential, which, uh, but that's also, that's easy. That's easy to do. To, to do that, but it's also very hard on the soul too. When it comes to, you say you're, you're following your bliss, do you mean something like the Ikigai or finding your purpose? Um, I think it's like listening to the, where your psyche is taking you. So I think there was this great, uh, there was recently on 52 Living Ideas, this great, great talk about that. And uh, the host of the show, he said that he, he switched over from music to be interested in uh, Jungian psychotherapy. And you think like, oh, someone who's doing music, they, they, they must already be following their bliss, right? But actually he found at that time he was, but then when it came to his late 20s, there's something that's very dissatisfactory about it. So I think your body naturally tells you. So you mentioned about the pillars. I think those other aspects of the pillars, they, they really are telling you in different ways that your mind is not telling you. So your body, it starts to kind of shut down more or or your spirit is not as enthused anymore. And that's because even if you're in this place where you are something that is someone who's seen as not following society's norms, once your body and your spirit are telling you, well, at this time, is I, I don't want you to follow this anymore. It's time to do something else. It's almost like that gut feeling too, which is the body, but then also having that emotional intuition as well as the mental logical calculations and just having those all come together in a way. Right. Yes. Yes. Everything. I think everything comes together. And when I, when I'm working with clients, I do keep in mind, it's important to look into the body, the spirit and the, and the mind. There's, I feel like when it comes to the, and, and the, and the heart, or you, you, you call it emotions, ideas, there's these paradigms in, in psychotherapy and they're all created, each paradigm is, I, I, I swear, is created by a certain kind of personality type, and that's their bias. So some are, like CBT is very based on the premise, your thoughts uh, are what lead to what your emotions are and how your behaviors are alike. And that's true, but that's only partially true. And I feel like when people only practice CBT or a pure form of CBT, I find that even those therapists who do that, I could see that they are, they're actually very exhausted because they're using their forebrain all the time to try to fix everything. And they're, they can't, they can't do that. And then, and then the other parts of them rebel, the part that's more intuitive or more in line with their body. So there's somatic therapies and there's also ones that are more even just about emotions. I'm not saying one is better than the other, but I think it's good to have different starting points. So what I mean by that is that CBT thinks it has figured everything out by including emotions, including behavior, but it's always starting from the assumption of thinking. 
of, of, yeah, the, of uh, rationality. And there's also other modalities that start with the assumption of emotion, that all we need to do is process emotion. And I think it's because when when they make a discovery, like they just like the ones who are more about emotion, they discover how much how transformative it is to just process emotion and not have the mind get involved. They say, okay, well, I see the truth because they really saw a significant truth, but they don't realize it's a truth. And then it's the same thing with the other fields. I think they've got into that inspired state where they saw like how effective their modality was. But then, and then, then they assume that's the only thing that could exist. And the other modalities can only exist as, uh, as sub parts of the greater modality in a way. Well, and something you alluded to earlier is that some people are identifying more in one area. They kind of start from their one pillar, for example. Right. And for example, like mind backgrounds and body. So I, a lot of my viewpoints on the other three pillars originates from the body. Right. But it, there's a certain amount of growth from that one pillar. Like you're, just because you're focusing on one doesn't mean the other ones aren't going to benefit or not benefit. Like negatively, it get impacted too. But for the example of when you've come from that one point of view, it limits you. Sometimes you do have to go outside of that pillar to another one and try to think from that viewpoint, that POV, so to speak, and try to maybe pursue CBD, CBT as that way. Right, right. Yeah. So I, I think it's good to have like, yeah, very different starting points to, uh, it just goes back to the idea. Like I, I'm uh, assuming I'm wrong. So it goes back to this idea with the interdisciplinary des design work that I was researching back in, in graduate school, that when people come together and they're of different fields and they have very different starting points of understanding things, it's actually healthier in a way. And, yeah. and one of the things is um, about education is during a time, they, they, they really experimented in that, that class that involved the artists and engineers that they actually include visual journals and they allowed students to doodle in class. And usually that's like regarded as a terrible thing to do in class. But what, what I saw was that they're actually accessing pre-verbal forms of, of knowledge when they're doing visual journals. And they actually recall more when they have that combination of the visual and the the linguistic in, in their notes. Especially since there might be more visual thinkers or something like that? Can start yeah, especially just the visual thinkers. And I think um, the the, vis the visual could capture the character of things in a very different way than, than the verbal does. Because I know that when I was in school, I did pretty poorly because I would always be that kind of visual person where I'd start doodling or writing or being creative and not paying attention to the class. And sometimes that might have been laziness or not being hustling hard enough to get to that good grade. But there was also this idea of like, I just didn't think in that rote memory kind of way, rote learning kind of way. And so what can we do then to fit education to each type of the brain, to each type of thinking? Yeah, I, I think there's, there's nothing wrong with how you you are doing things at, at the very core. And I think like, I think edu education can be very invalidating in a kind of way. So the, the example I like to give is like, um, what if every class that was taught in school was a sport, right? So someone like you would succeed in, in such a thing, right? But other right. people, like other kids, they're, what are they gonna do? They're not good at sports, they're gonna be tired every single day. So the same thing with the core curriculum that that's going to make other students tired. It's a very valid point. I will say that I was terrible at sports growing up. It wasn't until my late teenage years that I was anywhere close to any fitness, like right. uh, regimen or strength. So you're able to grow a side of yourself that was not present earlier. So, and I, I guess the point I have here is that uh, the problem with the education system is that they're making an assumption that this is the best way, but like with, there's a great educator, uh, uh, philosophy of education guy named uh, Sir Ken Robinson. He says, like, if you really uh, look at life with all its artistry and e e economy and, and business and technology and everything that makes it thrive, not, none of it's like really captured by the academic system. So life is not captured by the academic system at all. It's not. And this is one thing I've been trying to work on myself with Poly Innovator is this idea of modular education, forming right. around the student, not necessarily making the student form around the education. And it is interesting how, like, I haven't done much with it because I'm still experimenting and exploring the different ways of going about that. How do you make it modular without 
accidentally defaulting back to the old ways of doing things. Because every time I keep thinking of a ways of creating this platform, I think of like, okay, well, let's make it to this one. Well, that's literally what the set of place is doing. How can we expand upon that? So how do you think that could happen? Like to be, to be able to make education more individualized. Yeah. I think if we could allow teachers to be who they are, to bring their own natural skills, because that subconsciously gives the students the idea that they could be themselves. So the idea of education, I think it's as much psychology than, than the information that you're providing the kids. Education is teaching. Uh, I'm not blaming the teachers, by the way. I'm talking about the system as a whole. It's, it's teaching students fear. And it's teaching the, the students the idea of there's a hierarchy in which you need to be a certain kind of way to be better. But if we could design the education system so that, and even teachers are suffering under this because they're not allowed to be themselves. They're forced right. to be a certain kind of way. But if we could allow everyone to be exploring their natural path, it's actually easier. It's actually, you don't need as many controls. You don't need that much. Actually, less is better. The more you allow, I think there's this, Again, this idea of the forebrain, again, that's trying to take over. It's, it's happening at a grander sphere, but with education. The, the sphere of letting the, the ego mind letting control. And when we could have that balance between structure and chaos and see actually chaos is as contributory to progress as structure is, then um, actually giving everyone their individualized education and, and having a more productive or more fruitful society and healthier society is easier. And again, it's, it's the same thing as I said before that I think society is making things harder that don't need to be and easier where it does not need to be. Actually, when you put people into a natural space, they're going to really challenge themselves really hard. Yeah. Especially if they feel stimulated and close to their bliss as well. Right. So, kind of pivoting a little bit, so, something that you considered another concept similar to the polymath is the linky brain, which is something that a previous guest, Alex Dunstan, talked about, and you made a point that it, it is transcontextual thinking. Can you elaborate more on that? Yes. So, this is a, uh, a strong point of both our personality types in uh, how we use intuition and we use intuition in the sense of so the I and a P, E and a P. Uh, we use intuition in the sense of seeing as many objective possibilities as there are and being able to draw connections with them. And in Dario Nardi's work, he has called this uh, transcontextual thinking. So what happens is that actually when the brain is in this phase, it, it lights up like a, like a Christmas tree and every part is asynchronous. And yes, it's a very energy consuming way, uh, but, but it's very effective in its own, its own kind of way. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's like trying to find the best opportunity by spreading yourself thin, but because you spread yourself thin in that way, you end up finding an even better opportunity than if you were going a more linear path, perhaps. Right. Yes. Um, I, I would, I would agree with that. And I, I would say that this is not valued so much in the education system that ed education system covers one part. So I'm not saying everything is wrong, but, but if you look at it at an energetic level, it's good to have a balance between things. And that's, that's an area where it's, it's lacking. It's afraid of this lack of control. So what like uh, the philosopher Nietzsche was, he, he, he wrote about was this balance of the energy of Dionysus, the god Dionysus and the god Apollo. And Apollo is very structured and very metho methodological. But when, when Apollo is getting uh, neurotic, then he's trying to control everything. Um, that's when he's not even able to do his own things well. And that's where the Dionysian comes in this idea of the spontaneous, spontaneous uh, risk-taking energy that trusts the, that trusts the impulse of life, and we, the education system, like forgot how important that is. Like that's why I even cut out recess because it doesn't realize when brain is turning off from that forebrain, it actually can learn faster because kids actually learn faster when they're conversing with each other in recess than, than from a textbook in terms of 
learning learning language in a very academic way in a textbook. And it's interesting too, because just for example, I would go, I, when I went to a new school in my high school years, I would go to the summer school beforehand because I was just taking classes there, and half the school would be blocked off because it was a decently sized school and so many classes, and I would kind of take the more chaotic route of just taking like, hey, I want to explore the part of the school that I haven't seen yet. That was my first foray into that building. I wanted to see what was there. And it was a very kind of spontaneous thing. Like, okay, let's go past this little border here, they, this makeshift border they made and explore the areas that I'm not supposed to be in. But I learned a lot that way. And I learned how to navigate the school. And so when the school year started, I actually had a much better experience of finding where I needed to go next and knowing which teachers were where, that kind of thing. That's great. You would have been a lot of help to me because I was always lost. <laughs> well, yeah. I probably would have been the guy who was like, hey, yeah, dude, come here, let's go. Come on, Leon, let's go to class together. I'll take <laughs> yeah, I actually needed someone to take me to class because I, would, I, I, I was like a very absent-minded kid, so I was always in my head and I was always lost, so it was it was helpful. When, um, so, so basically I would show up in the middle of – there was one time I just showed up in the middle of class and said, oh, I, I finally made it, and all the kids just <laughs> laughed. <laughs> <laughs> Left or laughed? They laughed. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, you, you might have seemed like you were doing a joke there, too, which is kind of <laughs> funny. But um, it is interesting, too, because I was always in my head as well. I think that's part of it just being a teenager, too. Like, that's something I've grown to accept. Like, part of that was just being teenagers. You're constantly egotistical and conscious of yourself. But I think beyond that, maybe it was the intu intuition, but I had a pretty high EQ growing up. And I think partially genetics, too. My family has a pretty strong emotional quotient in their genes and just our habits. And it was interesting how I think I read people more and was able to understand people at a much deeper level for that age than most people around me. And right. so because of that, I thought everyone thought like me. And so like, hey, I'm going to be screwed because I'm outnumbered here and everyone's judging me about that. Yes. But in actuality, I was ahead of them. And I, and I say this not in an egotistical way, but more in like empathetic ways. Like, hey, I was overly self-conscious because of this and I probably didn't need to be. Yeah, that's that's right. Um, that That's a point of self-realization. So I, I always feel like there's this idea of what this reminds me of is that I, I believe there's these intelligences that actually conflict with one another. Mm. So that's why like the idea of IQ, you know, maybe it has a valid point, but it's also kind of uh, simple, oversimplifies the idea of what intelligence is. Because I believe there there's intelligence that get a, get in the way of each other. So like a very strong uh, EQ in that, that form of intelligence actually gets in the way of us being able to engage in other ways because our minds are so hyper aware mm -hmm. in that in that kind of emotional state of others. Wasn't it Gardner who came up with those nine different intelligences yes. and whatnot? Yeah, yeah. So it was interesting too because this is part of the reason why I think of the four pillars in that way. Almost like intelligences of like building up those pillars because sometimes the pillars can get in the way of each other. And so by pursuing the body, even though it does have mental benefits, it may take up time or opportunity cost from the mind or from the spirituality. And it is interesting too, if you go explore the intelligences as well. Supposedly there's like the courage intelligence and special quotient and the naturalistic. And then IQ is more split into like the spatial, spatial, logical, and then the mathematical kind of being separate. And I think that's, it is a very interesting way of like even the spatial logical versus the mathematical, even though they would often get clumped up into IQ, they could get in the way of each other because if you're aware of the logic of like this happens with this way then maybe the mathematics could often tell you something differently if you're very into right both. right Th this this uh brings me to the point like uh education is teaching us that we live in a hierarchy and we live in a dog eat dog kind of world and what i see is that actually we live in a forest and there's many different kinds of plants and and they all all these plants have different kinds of purposes in mind so um so I think every one of us is almost just like a plant, but yeah. a very specialized kind of plant. That's very interesting too, because it makes me think of two different analogies. For one, I'm a big Gary Vee fan because he talks a lot about gratitude, and he, I honestly considered him relatively a philosopher. Some people disagree with me, some people see him as egotistical, and to his their own, but I do think that he has a point of building people up, and he tries to go out of his way to build other people up. And he has a saying, he always says, I want to build the big, biggest building in town, not by tearing anybody else's down, but just by building the biggest building. You could change that analogy to the biggest tree. I want to build the biggest tree, not by tearing down the trees around me and making myself the biggest one, but by building the strongest tree there with the strongest roots. 
those roots are these social connections that you're making with people. And the bigger those roots, the bigger that tree is going to be and more fed it's going to be. But here's the also deal too. That tree is going to help the forest around it. Right. It's going to provide more shade for the plants that need more shade. It's going to be more suitable for living animals like squirrels and that kind of thing. So it's actually going to build up that forest. Right. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I would definitely agree with that. It's more like uh, ecology of some sorts and rather than like one one thing is trying to outcompete with the others. And I believe that's where that's where we've evolved. So maybe like before um, that's where our consciousness was at in the, in the past that you need to be more powerful than others. But even that ha that that has changed over time to becoming um, the idea of dominance also include like being more socially aware hmm. it's not just being more physically dominant and then afterwards just i think the 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 concept just has kept evolving since then um being able to see more possibility so there's not there's not even one way and even the idea of dominance is uh not even uh dominant anymore that's actually mm -hmm. a, a form of kind of like almost like a, a weaker psychology in the sense that it, it's limited it's, it's very limiting yeah well, and dominance also makes me think of specialization. The other analogy I was going to bring up is when I was talking to Abby Sheikh Lahodi on the show, we mentioned this idea of like the forest of knowledge and how different dominance of a different skill set or specialization is like a different tree. And the more you go into different ones, you're building up these different trees in the forest. And so it's kind of going back to that forest analogy. And I thought that was interesting too. It goes back to that dominance, building up the biggest tree, the biggest specialization, not by tearing everybody else down, but by building everyone up along the way. Right. Yes. Be interesting. Speaking of which, actually, an interest of yours, of your master's degree, was how interdisciplinary collaborations foster creativity. And so that actually relates to what we were just talking about. Can you share more on that? Yeah, so it's a lot along the lines of what you're saying, that actually everyone has their gifts. So mm -hmm. my, my, um, my research advisor has told me for every kid that is tested with ADHD, they need to be tested for creativity as well because there's so many um, similar traits between these two types of kids. They're often this is often very co-occurring. But if you look at the DSM, which is the the manual that uh, psychologists use to diagnose people, everything is put into negative. Everything's put into like what is the problem, and that's mm -hmm. I think that's the the problem that society has because. It's trying to fix things. It's getting into that mindset of trying to fix things. That's why everything has become very hard and difficult and about like you needing to work harder to, to try to fix things. So I think when going back to that, the research that I was doing then, I think it's actually fostering this psychology that everyone has their own innate potential to, to bring out. We could trust it. Mm -hmm. we, don't have to f we don't have to force anything we, we, could, we could really trust that process. And the idea of interdisciplinary is that it's a lot more organic. So we don't need to have, make, we don't need to make everyone be like, um, become a scientist. Like they, that's, I guess, because there was the space race uh, that they try to force everyone to be like a scientist or be in STEM. But like, in order to have the best scientists, you just allow people to be who they are. Because the, who, those who are the, who are naturally the best scientists are going to become the best scientists. But if you're trying to force people, then you're going to force people who are not going to be natural scientists. So I think the idea is actually, this is more than just like a fun research into interdisciplinary design. It, it sounds like a very fluff field, but actually I think it's actually really essential. It's very essential to education that um, to let everyone know, okay, well, we could get kids together who are of different fields. And then we just let things play out, let them have their conflicts, let, let, them, let them argue it out and then find a deeper aspect of themselves and come to a, an er, a place within themselves where they could transcend their original understanding of how everything has worked and how they have worked through realizing that they're not the best or and neither are they, they, they inferior, they, they are 
one part of a greater picture. Well, and it's interesting too. Another point on neurodiversity is that I've met a lot of people who are polymathic, but also have ADHD. Right. They almost diagnosed me with ADHD when I was younger, but my grandma, who's an MD, fought against it. She said, no, I don't think that's right. And so I'm very glad because the, the medication might have screwed me up when it comes to school and how I developed who I am. But do you think that people who are multidisciplinary or creative by nature are often misdiagnosed? So uh, some very interesting studies that have been done in the area was that ADHD medication does help does help certain people with uh, who are neurodiverse who have ADHD, but those who are lower functioning. So they found that actually when you control for um, whether someone has went to college, those who have went to college they actually do worse. They actually become less creative. They're less likely to come up with different ideas. And that's because in order to get to college, uh, they had to be able to organize themselves in a certain way. They're able to tap into their weaknesses and help themselves. So I'm saying, you know, I, I still believe that people who are low functioning, um, they benefit from just being themselves, but finding a way for them to be themselves. Yeah, That's interesting. yeah. Another another study that that helps with that is that they actually did a very complete. This is a, a really rare study because they did a very complete study on a whole entire population. They didn't even take a sample. They took everyone. Uh, basically, what happened is that they did a study on Iceland, and Iceland has three hundred thousand people in the population, and they have everyone's hospital records. And they know who's who in Iceland. There's only so many people who are famous. And when you look at the, the, the records, the medical records of people who are famous, they have elevated levels of subclinical le levels of depression and bipolar disorder among, um, uh, and schizophrenia. And then the relatives actually um, have clinical levels of these these things so they they come famous people come from backgrounds who are more likely to have these mental illnesses but the ones who become famous are the ones who are able to manage it they're able to so they're, they, they, yeah they, they they didn't get into the the kind of clinical levels of mm -hmm. it the, let's kind of say like the the best genius has a touch of madness kind of thing right yeah but I also don't want to be super superficial about it either because I think it's not simple. Again, I, I don't like this idea of compromise. I actually think there's with that madness comes like a, the demon that the demon within that that drives people, the muse that that drives people. The so it's a lot. Yeah, I think it's, it's a lot more sophisticated in a way like uh, you are being driven by energies that like normal society does not accept does not expect and it's not saying okay here's like your slight dose of um, creative energy okay but otherwise try to be normal and you'll you'll succeed i think it's actually um they're able to people who are creative they're able to tap into that fully and but there's there's some who are able to manage it well and there's others who still made a lot of creative contributions who did not manage it well. What do you think our environment has to do with polymathy? Do you think, is there like a feng shui of polymathy in a way? If, if there's a feng shui. So uh, basically my research five years ago, where it has taken me is to actually recreate my environment so that it is different and that it's supportive of my creative endeavors. And I realized right. I didn't have to create it. I What I did decide to do is I decided to join an intentional community. The intentional community is people who decide to uh, live together to share resources with one another. And what I found was that it's, it, it's pretty healthy. So like for me, like right now, at least I'm not like economically for communism. I, I, I do believe in uh, communal living, like being living together as groups because the nuclear family is actually an aberration of how people have been living for thousands and thousands of years. And uh, the way uh, suburbs are created fosters this illusion of just just when you're talking about the feng shui, like the, you're talking about how society, uh, society 
how society's thought reflects the psychology. So this idea of all these separate houses far away from one another fosters this idea of we're, we're separate, we're individual units, we're competing for um, survival, and we're, we have to completely depend on ourselves. So one, what I found with um, living in an intentional community is that people of different personality types, they take on their natural strong roles. So people who are uh, good at cooking, they lead in cooking. People who are good at uh, taking care of the cleaning, they lead in that. People who are good at maintenance, they, they lead in that area. And so you don't have to like uh, force yourself to do things that you're weak at, but at the same time, you can learn from people who are um, doing things that you're weak at. So if there's someone who's in charge of maintaining, then you could uh, basically shadow them and you, you, you treat them as a leader. But when it comes to your field, you treat yourself, you, you, they treat you as a leader. And so it's a lot more, it's a lot more natural. So meaning that uh, I could find my space, I have a lot more time to be able to pursue my creative endeavors, but because I actually believe that um, pe people used to live as a group, and that's why people now um, they don't have time. People. Yeah, exactly. Right. So before, people used to work like um, right. twenty hours a week in in travel groups, and I think it's because everyone's trying to just take on everything to themselves. And even as technology has improved, they just use that as a means to just take on more things to themselves and this artificial idea of what, what work is. I, I think that what you're doing there is actually really interesting. I really like that. So I, I like this whole idea of a intentional community and it reminds me of something rabbit eco village. It's, a, and it's in a state near me where they literally try to foster that kind of community and make it more natural and Dan dancing rabbit? more like self-sustaining. Is this dancing, dancing rabbit? rabbit that's yes. What it is. Yeah. yeah I heard and it's just it. interesting too, because I think that the key to smart cities. So for example, my obsession for technology and focusing on the future, it relies, I think that success relies on having communities like what you're saying there. Right. You have to have the philosophical aspect behind that technology or else it won't work. It doesn't matter if you have a smart city or smart technology building up the city structure and making the community stronger if the communities don't build it up with it too. Right, yeah, I, that there's a lot with, there's a lot of similarity, meaning I think people feel like there's a lack of resources because they just they don't know how to divvy it up properly. Meaning like if you design cities where there's a lot of public area instead of privately owned, like if it's it's public, it's for, it's for people and they could do something creative with it in some sort of way. I think um, then you get more bang for your buck, right? So the same thing, like I, yeah. I experienced it at the level with the intentional community is that just through the interactions with people, um, I'm getting more ideas because people are, they live right next to me and they're, we talk about ideas as a group. And, mm -hmm. and those are the ideas shared space. So we don't have to like, we could get all this food in uh, bulk and we could, uh, we could share it. And I'll give you another example, like the idea of the suitcase, like how many times do you use a suitcase in a year? So that's yeah. something that, or like a drill. That's something that's worth. That's something that's worth um, sharing. That's just being more resourceful, or like, just anything. Like I think the kids that grow up in the community, they have more adult role models. Like everyone's role models basically consist of two people, and then they can't take a break, at all. But whereas like in the community, yeah. they could take like a sabbatical <laughs> from, from their kid. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I, right. and, it, and it's better for the kid because they're learning from different people. So that, when they say it takes a village to raise a child, it actually is true. Yeah. And something that keeps coming up, it's like, it's bugging me. I, I just want to say it. So it's recorded too. It's just like this idea of the polymathic approach to cities. So a lot of engineers are looking at smart cities from the internet of things and c cloud and big data and how these technologies are going to benefit it. But like I said, just a moment ago, and like you're referring to too, it's these communities. You need those public spaces that are good for people to work together, come together. Barcelona's doing that with their little squares that they're doing over there to make it more public. People can come together for stands and markets and stuff like that and what they can do as a city. But then there's also the idea of the circular economy and making sure things are being cycled around or reused and the idea of resource sharing as well. Like I don't need a drill all my life. I need a drill to fix this one thing and then I can just put it back in the system. And so a lot of smart cities that are talked about, talk about like um, right. having kind of like a store where you just borrow stuff. You're not paying for anything. You just borrow the drill or shovel that you need for that day or week and then put it back. That's, that's a, and it's going to help. It's going to help with polymaths a lot. It's going to help with this idea of uh, creativity and interdisciplinary thinking and society in general, everything 
I think it's, it's just a lot more efficient. It's actually more practical to, to design a city that way. For sure. I, lo- I love that question too, because it's just a matter of like, the environment really does make a difference in your life. And that kind of makes me think too, what do you see nature versus nurture? Not just in polymathy context, but in general, just what are your thoughts? My, my thoughts on uh, nature versus nurture. So, I mean, it, it seems to me like, for instance, I know this is kind of controversial, but it seems to me that people are born certain types. So it's almost as if the personality type is almost like the hardware of the person. And you could see, like, uh, I think there's emerging evidence, it's not like solid evidence right now, that there's basic uh, fundamental different ways that the brain is wired almost like a hardware, but you could change the software mm-hmm. in it. And you could also change it greatly. So I, I think it's almost as if, like, we, like, almost like a video game, uh, everyone has their avatar and it moves certain ways, but then there's things you do in a game that could really enhance the avatar in a multitude of different ways so that it, it could be very different from how it started out from the very beginning. That makes me think of the whole modular education thing again, because I'm taking that skill tree based approach with, with it and how you're kind of leveling up with the skills that you're taking and making your avatar of this, your life essentially level up as well. Right. And something that made me think of with communities is this idea of working together. When you have the shared responsibilities, things happen much more effectively. And uh, a game I've been playing lately is this Apex Legends, where you're a small team of two or three, mainly th- usually three, and you're going around and just fighting other teams of the same size. And the real kicker is, most of the time when you lose, it's because someone went out on their own and tried to be a lone wolf. And it's like, literally, I, I was playing it earlier today and someone ran off far ahead of me, the other guy. And we were trying to catch up. We're both very speedy people. We were catching up. He got killed. And so we were not able to help them. And then the game lost. But then there's yeah, other cases where when you can combine your fire into one person and work as a team, and if you're getting damaged, you can cycle out, let another person rotate in, take over for a little bit, and then that person gets damaged and they cycle out. And you start doing that circular motion or like working together to target somebody. It is that communal thing that really makes the teams work and actually be successful. Yes. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. And that's the idea of um, when everyone could tap into their their true self, that's actually Mm -hmm. the best way they they serve others. So they actually, you see everyone naturally operate together and you see how fruitful and and effective that is and how enriching that is in the long run versus this whole idea of like, I'm just, um, I'm competing with everyone and I'm just to myself, I'm trying to, um, I'm trying to make things work. I'm trying to figure everything else out in my in my life. I think it's very different from that. Mm-hmm. Well, and this is kind of the idea behind the poly innovative construct of just bringing people together who are so philosophical and scientific, and such as the engineering and artistic people you mentioned earlier. How do you think we can do that more? And then, either as a society or as you and I as individuals, how can we bridge people like that together from from different fields? I think mm-hmm. it's to, yeah. aside from getting them together, to help them get past their, their bias, because I think people have an assumption there's a, there's a hierarchy of the disciplines. And then, uh, well, how do we get them together in the first place, though? Yeah, I, I think it is to get them together, it's first a kind of, it's a psychological thing that people see these biases. I think when people can get past these biases, they naturally want to get together because they think that's actually a really ex- exciting and very fruitful for them, actually something that's very beneficial for them. I think it's the, the bias of that there's this, this idea that one discipline is better than, better than another, often like the idea that hard scientists, hard sciences are better than the soft sciences, even implied in how they're called in itself, like hard and soft sciences, that there's certain disciplines that are better than the others. And, and I think that leads us to want to kind of de- defend our turf and say, okay, well, my discipline is the best and that's what's creating the barriers. But when people could conceptually see past barriers and they, they feel that they don't exist and they, they want to come together, because then they'll see what you see, that, that when you start to get together and work as a group, then it's a lot it's a lot more enriching and also in an end, you know, you don't end up losing. So you're working on your license in psychotherapy. How is that progressing? It's, it's going well. So I think along this process, um, I got to speak to people who are from very different fields in, in psychotherapy and it, it taught me a lot about how the mind works. So I feel like even when we're very different, 
there's a lot of this makeup that is inner makeup of all the clients that are the same and also the same as, as yours. And then what I find is actually part of the solution to the human condition and its difficulties is actually this lack of creativity, lack of polymath kind of thinking that everyone's stuck within a certain kind of energy in their in their life and how life is supposed to be. And that when we could introduce these concepts, which are regarded as fluff concepts of, well, actually, this is not what life has to be. It doesn't, it doesn't need to be as it's expected to be either. And if you could trust that, like creating an art piece and finding it's very different from how you expect and following, following your bliss, following your intuition and allowing for possibility thinking rather than figuring things out. Actually, uh, people end up not only in a better place, but also with a lot less hard work in the superficial sense. Right. And there's a lot more emotions. Uh, the thoughts are more emotion, that kind of thing. And I, I love that. Well, and so where can people find more about you online and learn, like contact you and stuff like that? Yeah, so um, I have a YouTube channel on uh, psychotherapy. It has my name on it, Leon Sao. And, and also I uh, have a channel on personality typology, which is called Type Tips. And I, I also like to run uh, meetup groups too. Well, I got links in the description for you as well anyways. What do you think could be a call to action for the audience? I think a call to action is, I know people could find themselves in a really hard place that they really want to have this sense of personal growth and they're realizing their potential, but they're, they're trapped and I want to let them know it's okay. And that's actually, it, this is a natural part of the process that part of the process is to, to in, encounter states of mind that are, that are like this, but there's all these tools available. And I, I, I think the tools, even though I'm working within the idea of psychotherapy there, it's, it's more than psychotherapy. It's actually the, the tools of life in a way that yeah. the idea that again, getting beyond all the labels, it's, it's these basic principles that I find when I'm pursuing all these different kinds of fields, no matter if it's as something, you know, I'm not that great in, which is chess or like when I'm doing artwork, for instance, that, that is these basic principles when you tap into it and get to know them. Uh, things become easier and more intuitive and it doesn't mean uh, lazy at all. Actually, you start to find yourself in uh, doing these challenges, but it seems to come from a very natural place. Right. I love that. And I do resonate with some of the things you're talking about too, with the whole idea, like there is a lot of challenges and just this past month or so, I've been dealing with that kind of seasonal affective disorder too, where the, this little winter is bringing me down and just being able to get things done. It's been hard, me too. but, um, well, yeah, well, I'm glad I'm not in it alone then. We're, we're, in, it, we're in it together, Leon. <laughs> so once again, this is Dustin Miller, Poly Innovator, and Leon Sal on the Polymath Polycast. Thank you for joining. It's, it's great to be here. This, is, this has been a pleasure to be on the show.